This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. There are two chapters dealing with economics. This, the first one, deals with what's known as macroeconomics. And the word macro means large. So, so this is the branch of economics which deals with basically national and international effects. Uh, and this is really the sort of uh, area where governments tend to be very interested and will intervene. So macroeconomics will be uh, addressing topics uh, such as how can we measure the size of a country's economy? Uh, how do we know if it's growing or shrinking and so on? What, what is the method of measuring it? If it's stagnating, if it's not growing, uh, then how can we stimulate the economy to make it grow? Uh, what about unemployment? Uh, what What is the unemployment rate? Uh, what affects it? If we've got 10% of people out of work, how can we get that down to maybe only 6% of people out of work? What, what sort of macroeconomic levers does government have uh, to affect unemployment? Inflation, how can that be uh, controlled? Uh, we know that there's usually some sort of inflation in every economy, usually when it's down at 1 or 2 percent, nobody worries. But if it goes up into like 20, 50, 100 percent uh, per year, uh, one of the effects, of course, is that uh, people continually need pay rises to keep up with it, their savings diminish in value and, and, and so on. It's really not a good situation. Also, although we don't have to, but uh, in this syllabus, macroeconomics will look at uh, uh, exchange rates, foreign currency exchange rates, and what influences that, uh, and uh, maybe how our imports and exports uh, compare. Is there a, a gap, if you like, between those? As I said, government is likely to get particularly um, uh, involved in macroeconomics and the uh, areas that government gets uh, involved in uh, there's a huge number of influences and here we're just looking at a, a kind of summary of it here uh, so down the left you have uh, the government and down the right of this uh, you have the effect on the, the organizations <clears throat> so uh, the government's ov overall economic uh, policy uh, will influence market demand. So we'll see later that if the government were to reduce interest rates, it means that more people are willing to borrow, uh, and usually once you borrow you spend, uh, and therefore this stimulates the demand in the economy. The cost of finance is, is connected with interest rates uh, uh, as well, uh, but if interest rates are low, uh, then it means it's relatively cheap for businesses to raise loan capital uh, and to invest in new machinery, new factories, expansion of the business. Taxation, of course, governments need taxation uh, to uh, help them with government spending. Uh, but, you know, you could well argue that if, if, if taxation was around 95%, uh, why would anyone kind of bother working? Uh, if it's only going to be it's certainly a disincentive to working much overtime. Uh, if taxation was way down at 5%, there's lots of uh, incentive to work, you keep nearly all of it, but of course it may not raise enough cash for government purposes. So, so deciding on the, the taxation rates, uh, and of course we know that a low taxation rate in a country can encourage uh, foreign companies to come in and set up there, to benefit from a, a low taxation regime. Industry policy, protection versus free trade. So protection is where the government, uh, for example, puts tariffs on imports. Uh, there's a lot of talk about this at, at the moment, but if, uh, let's say, it was on cars, and the government says, right, I will put 100% tax on all cars being imported, then uh, essentially they are protecting the home car industry. Free trade is reverse. Free trade would say you can import, export to your heart's content and the government will 
will not in any way seek to control that. The government can uh, try to encourage certain areas. It can give grants. It can give grants, for example, maybe to set up high-tech industries. It can give grants to uh, get companies to set up in areas of the country uh, which have got high unemployment. Regulation. Uh, how much? How easy is it, uh, for example, to set up a business? And in the UK, it's pretty easy to set up a business. You just register a company with Companies House and you're really ready to go. Entry barriers, capacity. Uh, sometimes the government will limit the uh, number of businesses of a particular sort which it wants to be set up. So the government could, if it wanted to, say we have uh, you know, enough television channels at the moment uh, and we're not going to allow another television channel uh, for whatever reason until maybe one of these ones uh, goes out of business. The infrastructure, the road, the rail, the uh, ports, uh, the airports uh, are going to influence the economy because uh, transport, distribution, getting hold of raw materials, distributing your finished products and so on is made harder or difficult according to the infrastructure. Social policy. Uh, if the government says once you hire somebody uh, uh, you can never ever make them redundant and you can never ever dismiss them no matter how useless they are in that very extreme situation uh, companies are going to be very reluctant indeed to go out and hire more people because if they make an error and get the wrong person or if uh, the business has a bit of a downturn and they're left having to pay high wage bill uh, then the people are going to be very reluctant to employ people. If, however, and I'm not saying there should be no em employment protection, uh, but if there's what you might call a more reasonable form of employment protection, so that you know, economic necessity could be maybe put up as a reason to make people redundant, then uh, the chances are that the employment rates on, in general are going to be lower. People will employ people knowing that in an emergency they can actually get rid of them. Also social policy will look at the training which is provided by government, the, the schools, the technical colleges, the university, maybe uh, subsidies given to, to train your staff. And then there is uh, foreign uh, policy. Uh, the government can get involved in uh, trade delegations to try to encourage exports. Uh, the government can provide export uh, guarantees, export credits, so that if the foreign customer doesn't pay, uh, the government insurance scheme will make sure you haven't lost everything. So there's a myriad of ways in which the government can influence the economy and businesses. Now, how is income measured? And uh, national income is defined as a total value of a country's final output for all new goods and services. It's important that we uh, remember it is final output because if a company buys raw materials, that is a purchase, incorporates that into a product, sells it to a member of the public, that's another purchase if you like, but really you're double counting the, the raw material element. So it is the final output of all new goods and services. So it's household spending. This is on, on think, think of it, food, groceries, cars, uh, televisions, anything that we spend money on. It can also be spending money on rent. Plus capital investment spending. Now, note this capital investment spending. This is companies, okay? Because when a company buys a machine, uh, really that machine uh, for, as a non-current asset that's not going to be sold on to a member of the public when a company buys raw materials that is going to be sent on and we have this double counting problem but if a company goes and buys a machine then of course that is a, a final output is a final purchase there's government spending government spending on wages for example for teachers for the armed services uh, for for uh, uh, 
you know, putting up new buildings, for building roads, uh, that comes into national income. Export, export is money coming in from abroad, but import, note that imports of goods and services, this is essentially money leaking out of the economy as it goes to foreign suppliers. And this gives us a gross domestic product. Uh, and the gross national product is a gross domestic product plus uh, profit income from abroad. So if a company had a foreign subsidiary and has paid dividends, that becomes part of the gross national product. The circular flow of income is a uh, concept uh, which is, is very, very close to uh, measuring the income of, of a business, really. It, it recognises that the economies work by really the flow of money round and round. So a, a firm produces goods and we spend money on those goods. Us spending money on those goods uh, allows the company uh, to pay wages to, to its workers and in exchange they provide labour. So there's all this kind of toing and froing, if you like, this circular flow of income, as it's called. If the circular flow of income increases, uh, then, of course, the total income of the country is going to increase because more goods are being sold, more wages are being earned, uh, more is being spent uh, by uh, households on goods uh, and so on. Uh, and the larger the circular flow of income, then the larger the national income is going to be. How can we make it larger? Well, government spending. So one way government can spend is simply to print money. It's not, a, not an advisable method of spending, uh, but simply printing money, distribute that to people, you know, send it out to people, give them a thousand dollars each, say, spend it. Uh, then, of course, the uh, consumer spending is going to go up. The uh, amount of goods bought is going to go up. Consumer bed, uh, spending goes up. Companies need to produce more. They need to pay more in terms of wages. Uh, in the income. Stimulate exports and uh, in investment. Uh, so uh, an injection into this here is basically uh, to spend money on building a new factory. You spend money in building a new factory, this is going to produce more goods, you pay people more income, uh, it's providing more work for people, uh, and this will increase the circular flow of income and will increase national income. Leakages or withdrawals from uh, the system, taxation can simply suck money out. Savings. Savings, uh, economists often don't know what to make of savings. Savings are, are set up as being a worthwhile endeavour. Uh, it's money for a rainy day. Uh, but of course, if you put money in the bank, it is not being spent, it, it is not going to a firm, the firm doesn't have to produce those goods, and if a firm doesn't have to produce the goods, it means it maybe doesn't have to employ all of those people. So the uh, uh, higher savings, the, there's a potential of actually reducing the income of the country. If we're all spendthrifts, and particularly if we go out and borrow and spend it, then the national income of the country will increase, although it may put us in a personally perilous situation. And then another leakage is imports. Instead of spending money in our country on goods and services, uh, giving employment to people in our country, the money just leaks out abroad. Aggregate demand and aggregate supply Aggregate demand is total demand in the economy for goods. Think of it as a kind of a measure of national income. Aggregate supply is a total supply of goods and services in the economy. So these should match. So here we have an equilibrium point here where the, the price of the goods has 
fallen sort of aggregate demand uh, here. The, uh, as their output goes up, the aggregate demand is growing along this axis here. So as the price of goods falls, people will buy more goods. Uh, and as the price of goods rises, uh, factories and, and, and producers will be motivated to produce more goods. And at some point you have an equilibrium in the economy uh, where uh, the goods produced precisely match the goods which are demanded at a certain price. If for some reason aggregate demand increases, in other words goes from here to here, and we'll see how we could maybe stimulate aggregate demand in, in a moment, then uh, the aggregate supply will gradually increase as well to match it. Aggregate demand increasing tends to put prices up. There are people, if you like, competing over the purchase of goods, it will put the market price up. This in turn will encourage new suppliers to enter the market and we end up at point B where supply and demand are matched again but at slightly higher prices. Now this will continue, this can continue uh, until say we got to here. So we keep increasing the aggregate demand, it'll come out to kind of here. Uh, and then when we try and supply more goods we find that we can't because everyone's working. Everyone's working as much overtime as they possibly can. Uh, we can't lay our hands on any more material, that's all used up and so on here. But particularly when full employment is reached, no more goods can be made. So we have increasing demand but a fixed number of goods. There's much competition for these goods and, and the way the match is kind of made is that the price rises. The price of the goods will rise up uh, until essentially again uh, demand and supply will match, but they will match at a much higher price. And this is this basically causes inflation. If there are too many people chasing too many goods, the price of those goods will go up, and that is a cause of inflation. A rightward shift in the aggregate demand curve, this is what we're looking at now. We're not talking here uh, about moving up and down the curve. We're not talking about going like that. We're talking about a rightward shift. In other words, we're moving like that from demand one to demand two. That's a rightward shift. And it means that, that at any particular price of the goods, there's more demand. So we stimulated demand, if you like, uh, for goods, even though we haven't dropped the price of those goods. Ways in which that could happen? An increase in disposable income. Maybe by reducing tax. Another way in which you can increase disposable income is by reducing interest rates. So in many economies, many people's disposable income goes on paying for their mortgage. If mortgage interest rates fall down, uh, then uh, people have more spending money, they will go and spend it, uh, and so the aggregate demand increases. And there will be a danger in very low interest rates economies that inflation may creep in. Consumers deciding to save less. So they take this money out of the bank and they simply spend it on goods. That for, even though the price of goods is not decreased, people are simply psychologically willing to spend money. Increased government spending. The government steps in uh, and, for example, uh, starts buying. So you could think of a uh, health service Health service got patients and hospital has to feed them, uh, and uh, the policy is to feed them much better and much more food. So that government spending on the health service is, of course, buying food from producers and supermarkets that otherwise wouldn't have been bought. A more relaxed monetary policy, uh, like interest rates going down, like making it easy for people to borrow money, and a change in net exports. Uh, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> a change in net exports will uh, stimulate uh, a rightward shift in the demand curves. 
It can go the other way, of course, a leftward shift on the demand curve. If you decrease disposal income, if the government, instead of taxing at 30%, maybe taxed at 70%, uh, and the government borrowed less, the government will be maybe spending the same, but we've got less money in our pockets to spend. That would put a dampener on the economy. If interest rates go up, this tends again to put pressure downwards on the economy. Uh, if you have to pay much more on your monthly mortgage, you've got much less to spend on food and clothing and travel. Uh, uh, higher interest rates dampen consumer spending down and are used actually as an antidote to inflation. Now, inflation is the price of goods going up for no, no particular reason. Uh, and the uh, causes are, as we've talked about demand pool, where the aggregate demand is higher than the aggregate supply, uh, more goods are demanded than can be supplied, and that competition to buy goods pushes up the price of the goods. There is cost push. So the cost of goods increases. Uh, for example, uh, uh, people are paid more. So our government has uh, uh, increase the minimum wage which people uh, must be paid. Increasing the minimum wage uh, obviously pushes up the wage bill of uh, employers uh, and they will inevitably pass on that increase in cost in an increase in price. That is cost plus, cost push. It can of course be seasonal uh, if you are buying uh, petrol, buying wheat, uh, by many foodstuffs, uh, costs can go up because of weather defects uh, and they, that will feed into or potentially feed into inflation. Import cost uh, inflation. Uh, the foreign country uh, puts, uh, for some reason there's, there is extra cost on imports. It could be uh, that the exchange rate has changed so that importing stuff from America is now more expensive. Uh, it could be uh, that um, uh, consumer demand in the foreign country increases and as pushes up the price of goods there and any which are exported to us are, are similarly going to be inflated in price. Expectation. Expectation is where you're bargaining for your pay rise and you say, well, I think next year inflation is going to be 10%, therefore I'd better ask for 12%. And of course, if that 12% is then incorporated into a wage bill, it will cause inflation next year. And finally, an increase in the money supply. Uh, for example, the decrease in interest rates, making it easier for people uh, to borrow, the government uh, printing more money, as it's called, all increases the amount of money which people have available to spend, uh, and that can cause inflation. Unemployment, the types of unemployment, uh, you just need to know kind of what they are. Real wage unemployment is where wages have increased to a point uh, where employers uh, will not employ anybody else at that price. Uh, so the wages are so high that it acts as a dampener on employment and it may even encourage employers to try to get rid of some of high, some of the high salaried individuals. Frictional unemployment is temporary. Frictional unemployment is the unemployment, uh, identified with people between jobs. So it's temporary. So you might leave your job now and you might have two weeks unemployment before you start your new job. Uh, so it's, it's not a big problem normally. It's pretty inevitable if people are moving jobs, you have a bit of frictional unemployment. Seasonal means what it says. We have seasonal uh, unemployment, let's say in the UK, in the building industry and in the agricultural industry in winter. Uh, it, because of rain and weather, it can be relatively hard to put up new buildings. Uh, obviously, the, the, the harvest is over with. There's no fruit picking and so on in winter. Uh, the holiday business 
is also a seasonal business and gives rise to seasonal unemployment. Structural unemployment is, is a much more serious one and it is long term and probably irreversible. For example, uh, in the UK, uh, probably 40 years ago, uh, we had a, a very large coal mining industry and now we don't have one at all. And the reason we don't have one uh, at all, there are various reasons, uh, but all our mines were deep mines and relatively expensive to get coal up uh, and it was much cheaper to import coal uh, which was really found on the surface in certain countries. There was also the beginning of the feeling that, that coal uh, was a particularly polluting form of fuel uh, and so it was a move away from coal to gas. This is a structural unemployment in the coal mining industry. Uh, uh, those jobs will never come back as far as we, we, we know. Uh, it, it, it's very tough on the people who lose their jobs and so on. Governments do try to come in and encourage other businesses to replace it and, and so on. But if you are you know, a 50 year old uh, miner and lose your job, then retraining to other skills and the social dislocation that can be caused by any sort of structural unemployment can be severe. Technological unemployment, I always think is almost a substructure, a sub subset of structural unemployment. Technological unemployment comes through advances in technology, quite obviously. So think uh, what would happen if uh, um, uh, computer controlled vehicles uh, uh, where they, they, they can drive without a driver uh, become safe and accepted. Think what that is going to do to all the thousands of people who drive lorries and drive vans and maybe even taxi drivers. So, so the technology of um, uh, you know, GPS, automatic vehicle driving and, and, and the like will potentially give rise to considerable unemployment, but I think it's another form of structural unemployment. Cyclical unemployment really uh, relates to uh, cycles in industry or cycles in the economy. Uh, most economies go through a kind of very long cycle, something like 10 years. If you think, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not dead regular, uh, but if you think, you, you know, how long is it between crashes in the stock exchange and, and economic crises and so on, you, you know that things can go very well and then they can go very badly. And the whole world economy almost goes through um, some sort of longish cycle. And of course, at the bottom of this cycle here, uh, where things are in the doldrums, then there's going to be much more unemployment. How can the government uh, exchange, how can the government, I beg your pardon, uh, try to control the economy? What levers does it have to pull and push there? And the first set of levers is known as fiscal policy. And here the government uh, looks at government expenditure, government income and government borrowing. If the government is going to spend money, it has to raise the money either from tax or from borrowing. What the government can do uh, if it wanted to stimulate the economy is to borrow much more and spend it. Uh, and during the last recession, the, you know, the banking crisis 2008, uh, some economists said that because everyone's frightened now of spending money, uh, banks won't lend money and so on. What governments should do is they should go out and borrow money and governments should spend money uh, to stimulate employment and then to stimulate uh, uh, wages and salaries uh, and then the government's income through tax will, will, will gradually increase. Other economists said that that was wrong uh, that what happens if the government borrows a lot, the government has to pay a lot of interest. Uh, and really what we should do is to cut the expenditure down. 
And if we cut the expenditure down, we should try and, of course, cut the, the deficit, cut the borrowing down uh, and, and, and like. Uh, but, of course, what also happened was that uh, many people's income fell and, and taxation takings fell as well. But uh, fisc, fisc here in fiscal policy really meant the the king's purse in, in, in Old English, I think. Uh, so the government has to keep these um, in balance, really. Uh, uh, so the government, if it wants to spend more, either has to tax more. But of course, that is taking money out of the economy. Uh, you can't spend that money directly. Uh, and that may have its downsides as well. The other uh, method is monetary policy, which is looking at how the government can manage the supply of money. And it can do it by interest rates, or at least the, the central bank does it by interest rates. The lower the interest rates, the easier it is to borrow, the more money people will borrow. That's going to increase the supply of money. It's going to stimulate the economy. There is the money supply. The government can increase or decrease the money supply itself. It's not called printing money anymore, it's called quantitative easing, but it makes much more money available to banks and so on, which they can then lend on. Reserve requirements and credit controls, this is saying how much uh, uh, money banks can lend on. So if I deposit money in a bank of a thousand, the government might say that you have to keep, for safety, you keep 10% of that in the bank so you can go and you, know, you can repay people if they want their money back and you lend on to people 900 so people now have got borrowed 900 that's going to be spent etc etc uh, and ultimately it's going to find its way back to the bank uh, and it put 90 in there uh, and this will allow 810 to be lent on again so money is not just lent once. Money is lent, is spent, goes into the bank, is lent again, is spent, goes into the bank, and round and round. So this is a this is you can see is going to add up to quite a, a lot of money, which banks can lend up. If, however, instead of uh, keeping the reserve requirement at ten percent, you kept it at fifty percent, then the pattern is going to be rather different. Uh, of a thousand put in the bank to start with. 500 goes there, but the bank can only lend on to businesses and people 500. That's going to find its way back into the bank as people earn the money it's spent on in companies, they put the money in the bank. And this you know, very quickly goes down, it, it diminishes very, very quickly. And I think you can see at the end of the day the amount of money which has been created here. It's going to be much less than the amount of money which is created through the banking system if the reserve requirement is, is much lower, is only 10%. And finally, the government might try to change or manipulate exchange rates. This is actually notoriously difficult uh, because the markets are of such power, international money markets are of such power that, uh, you know, banks, uh, that governments are rarely masters of the exchange rate. They might try to have an official one, but very quickly all sorts of black markets grow up. Functions of taxation. Uh, we know that taxation is the way the government raises money. Uh, but as well as uh, raising money, there are certain other functions of tax, uh, like you put a tax on cigarettes, and this is to uh, uh, diminish the consumption of something which is regarded as being unhealthy. You can uh, put a tax on uh, flights, on aircraft, and on aircraft journeys and so on, because uh, aircraft uh, do cause noise, aircraft do cause pollution, uh, and unless you tax that, there, there's no other easy way in which the airlines bear more of the cost of the side effects which they're causing in the economy. It can be redistributive. Uh, generally speaking, uh, people who are on very high incomes are taxed at a higher rate than people on very low incomes. 
Uh, and, and part of the reason is you take a lot of money from the people in the high incomes and maybe through social security benefits or the provision of maybe free health care and so on, you effectively redistribute some of the money. Protect industries from foreign uh, competition. Uh, tariffs are a form of taxation. So we talked about cars coming into the country. You slap on a 100% purchase tax on those. Uh, then this is going to protect your own home industry from imports. And to provide a stabilizing effect on national income. If you think the national income is getting overheated and inflation is a risk, then you can increase tax a little bit, take some of that disposable income away from people, and this will put a dampener on the economy and tend to reduce uh, the amount of inflation. Types of taxation. Uh, a regressive tax uh, takes a higher proportion of a poor person's salary than a rich person. So VAT is a regressive tax. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor in the UK, VAT is a 20% tax on many forms of consumption. Uh, so if I go out and buy, let's say, a mobile phone for uh, $300, there's going to be tax on that at 20%, that's $60. Of course, $60 out of a poor person's salary is a much greater proportion than out of a rich person's. A proportional tax takes the same proportion of income from all levels. So simply setting your income tax level at 20% for everyone is a proportional tax. And then we have a progressive tax, like the more common type of income tax, tax very low paid people at zero, then you come in and you begin maybe paying 20% tax, and then at some band higher on, you begin uh, paying 40% uh, on that. And finally, in this chapter, just remember the difference between a direct tax and an indirect tax. A direct tax is like income tax. or corporation tax. It is basically a burden on the income of this person that is paid over to the land revenue. I know that an income tax, your employer kind of takes it off and pays it to the land revenue, but, it, but that's, that's a, an administrative business, really. It's your income, it's your tax. That is taxing you directly. An indirect tax uh, is, is like VAT. It is collected by the revenue authority from an intermediary. So, so what happens is that if you go out and buy something, say clothing from a shop, the shop puts on 20% and then that 20% has to be handed over to inland revenue. The shop is acting as a tax collector, that is an indirect tax. It can be a specific tax uh, as a fixed sum per unit sold. So in the UK, uh, say on a bottle of wine, uh, there's a fixed tax. There's a fixed tax on a packet of cigarettes. There's a fixed tax on uh, a bottle of whiskey and so on. It's nothing to do with how valuable the item is. It's a fixed sum per litre or per 20 cigarettes, whatever it is. An ad valorem tax is a proportion of the value, a, fix, a fixed percentage of the price of the good, of which VAT is an example of an ad valorem uh, tax, which is proportional to the value of the item.